Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk about Japan in World War II. Uh, World War II is obviously this huge moment in global history, in 20th century history and in Japanese history. And as a result we could have spent weeks and weeks in World War II, whereas it seems I'm only going to do this one video on the Japan experience in World War II. Well, yes and no, I've kind of been talking about World War II for a while now, even before we broke up for the break, and we're going to still be talking about it for a while to come. There's kind of, I think there's two broadly different ways of looking at um, Japan in the war, particularly in the context of how I'm doing it in this video. Um, number one, the Japanese experience in the war is very, very good, at least militarily speaking, for quite a long time, right up until the middle of 1942. And then it's very bad, very, very rapidly bad, and they lose pretty dramatically. There's a lot to unpack there, of course, but that's kind of a fairly kind of, you know, relatively decent trajectory of Japan in World War II, which is kind of one of the th interesting things about World War II is it's very kind of narrative friendly both in the Pacific Theatre and back in Europe. There's this sense, both in Europe and in Asia, of there being this unstoppable foe um, early on with uh, Nazi Blitzkrieg and um, with the Japanese war machine of 1939, 1940 and 1941. Um, there's this sense the enemy is implacably evil, um, which I think the Nazis gave ample uh, reason to believe that. Um, and certainly, uh, sadly enough, the Japanese military uh, gave plenty of reasons to th feel that way about them as well at least their opponents. Um, and then the success when it comes on the Allies side is, is kind of almost feels relentless, almost. So, um, but there's more to it than that, of course, and the role of the Japanese in the war is huge. How are they treating their colonies? What does it mean to be Japanese? What does it mean for the Japanese political system? How will the Japanese react to it? Um, that word fascism I've been hinting at again and again and again um, comes up. Is Japan fascist? Does this matter? Why should we care? And again, that question is going to go on and on um, for a while after this. Because the question of how to rehabilitate Japan will become a major post-war question. But we're not there just yet. We're still talking about Japan in the war. So as we talked about in previous classes, Japan is effectively fighting World War II from 1937 onwards. That's certainly the year when the Chinese consider World War II to have begun because the Japanese invaded them. Um, the Japanese are on a war footing as of 1938 and their relationship with the Western world, which has been deteriorating very, very badly, collapses at the end of the 1930s. Now in 1933, the Japanese had walked out of the League of Nations ostensibly in anger at the British and French refusal to issue this statement about the equality of races and so on and so on. But in practice, it was just the natural result of relations breaking down over the Japanese uh, actions in Manchuria. Now, there's, it takes a long time for different aspects of this relationship to completely collapse. The Japanese and the British and the Americans in particular have been getting on, you know, famously well, really, for a couple of decades at this point. And I mentioned, you know, the baseball trips and things like this. There's various kinds of cultural exchange. There's a lot of trade going on between Japan and the Western world. And this stuff doesn't automatically go um, away as the 1930s goes on. In fact, Japan is heavily reliant, particularly on the US, for various things such as copper and particular for oil. Um, and they need oil for their aircraft carriers and their fighter jets and their tanks and all these other kind of amazing aspects of what is a modern, incredibly impressive Japanese war machine. And going up throughout the 1930s, the Japanese are still receiving many, many of these goods from uh, the United States and from the West. Now, this uh, is causing issues, in particular, Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of what the Americans are calling Free China, as opposed to Communist China, that will merge later on. Um, Chiang Kai-shek, you know, appeals to uh, the American public uh, with his wife, Madame Chiang, who's uh, far more kind of eloquent and convincing than him, um, that they need help from people, that they must stop uh, purchasing Japanese goods. There's still trade ongoing. Chiang Kai-shek and his wife appeal to the world for support. To you, who are enjoying the serenity and security of your own homes, I wish to bring a message from the women of war-ridden China. It is this. If you wish to avoid the calamities that are befalling China now, and the killing and mutilation of your loved ones and your fellow beings, boycott Japanese goods. Now this all changes in 1940. Um, the Japanese take Vietnam from technically from the Vichy government of France, 
which in practice, of course, is just a puppet regime of the Nazis. The Japanese receive Vietnam more or less because they are allies of the Nazis. And therefore, the, this is just one of the benefits they get. Now, the strategic interest for them in acquiring Vietnam is it's going to make it much harder for anyone, uh, whether it be the British, the Fr Americans or anybody else, to get goods into China. And they're seeking to blockade China and make Chinese resistance uh, to make it go from being what at the time was uh, horrifically difficult for the Chinese to uh, basically impossible. Um, you may not know this, uh, it's, it's well known that the Russians lost the most people in World War II, but the Chinese are second behind them in that particular table, um, which is astonishing really, considering that the Chinese largely are just fending off an assault by the Japanese the entire time. Um, the Russians at least get to storm Berlin. Uh, this doesn't really happen for the Chinese. So the transfer of Indochina over to Japanese control uh, creates pretty significant problems. And finally, the Americans choose to embargo um, oil sales to Japan. And up to this point, American oil still constitutes about 80% of Japanese oil. Um, the Japanese are hugely, hugely reliant on these supplies from the Americans. So, you know, there's this long-standing idea as the 1930s are going on, and in the last video I talked a lot about, you know, the practical considerations and needs of war balanced against how it's being ideologically kind of set up by the Japanese, and certainly there was um, a convenient dovetailing between this notion of the Japanese leadership of Pan-Asian identity against the white capitalists with what was a genuine attempt by the West to prevent the Japanese from becoming any more powerful than they already were. Going back to the 1910s, 1920s, there were various treaties, naval treaties and the like, such as the Washington Treaty of 1922, that had sought to specifically limit Japanese military uh, capacity, uh, you know, uh, proportional to what the West already had, or to what British and um, American navies, for example, in the Washington case, already had. So, so this is dovetailing together. At the same time, um, in addition to just not wanting to make an enemy of the U.S., the United States in the 1930s is. You know, they're not a major player in world affairs, partly through American choice. Um, nobody is in any doubt at all that once the United States chooses to get involved, that they will have a decisive impact in the war. You know, this is something I talk about in class all the time. Uh, Winston Churchill's famous speech, you know, we will meet them on the beaches, we will fight them on the, we will fight them on the beaches, we will fight them on the landing grounds. That speech ends with an appeal to the United States, where he actually ends the speech by saying, and if they ever drive us off the island of Britain, we'll continue to fight them from our ships, um, and we'll fight we'll basically until the last man is defeated. Um, but we'll fight them until the new world comes to save the old. This is the Churchillian line. Um, and and he, was, he was desperate in the United States to get involved in the war. And as of 1940, the United States is not yet involved in the war, um, but the, the taking of Indochina by the Japanese signals an aggression on behalf of the Japanese, at least from the perspective of the Americans and the West as a whole, um, that action needs to be taken. And so, as you might imagine, um, the United States and Japan relationship deteriorates very badly. And it also creates a real problem for the Japanese, which is they have about two years of oil left, um, you know, stockpiled. And where's the rest of the oil going to come from? The short answer to that question was this, you know, great East Asia co-prosperity sphere I talked about in the last video, um, going further south towards Malaya and Papua New Guinea and places like this. And you're seeing it in the readings for this week, these Japanese experiences in what are these newly acquired kind of far flung parts of the empire. But it also creates a certain sense of urgency, and this is what largely motivates the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. There's this thinking, at least among some Japanese military strategists, that um, you know if they can take out the Americans or give the Americans a bloody enough nose, that it would keep the Americans out of the Pacific theater. Of course, this famously backfires. Over 3,700 Americans die on the day, or at least reported to have died. Um, and there's this huge uptick in American propaganda against the Japanese and a real sense of being on a war footing against the Japanese. You know, one, one um, immediate uh, product of this, of course, is the internment of Japanese um, and Japanese Americans living in the United States and also this sense of, you know, this, this full on war effort. And any kind of ambivalence the Americans had to getting involved is gone. And now they're involved. And, and this theme of remember Pearl Harbor becomes this major kind of calling card for the Americans. And of course, you know, the whole Hitler being evil thing doesn't hurt either. Um, famously, Pearl Harbor was not necessarily intended to be a uh, sneak attack. Um, uh, the idea was that um, war would be declared, you know, moments before the attack actually happened. Um, various problems, including clerical errors in Washington, D.C., 
and challenges over the international dateline meant that the declaration came after the attack, allowing the Americans to, uh, you know, depict it as a sneak attack. Now, in fairness, it it was a sneak attack. I mean, even though the declaration was planned and everything else, they, they weren't trying to telegraph it. They weren't saying, by the way, two weeks from now we're going to attack Pearl Harbor. They were kind of trying to technically avoid the sneak attack um, language. But of course, it couldn't have been a huge shock to the Americans anyway. The relationship was going very, very badly and the Japanese were clearly becoming more aggressive and more confident as every single month went by. And in fact, the relationship between the two countries had been deteriorating particularly badly as 1941 went on. So it couldn't have been this, you know, massive, massive shock uh, per se to strategists, yet it seems to have been exactly that. Um, famously, despite the terrible loss of life um, and loss of military capacity on the day, the American aircraft carriers remained relatively unscathed, and this turns out to be really important later. Pearl Harbor, in truth, is coming right at the high point of Japanese military power. 1941 was very kind to the Japanese military, and this success went on through into the summer of 1942. In February of 1942, Singapore falls to the Jap to Japanese troops. There's actually primary sources of British um, personnel in Singapore. Singapore, of course, is British territory at this point, as was Malaya, um, and now, now as we call Malaysia. Um, and uh, they're, they're, the British were, op some British, I should say, were openly kind of scoffing at the idea the Japanese could take Singapore or take it quickly. Um, and in some cases, actually commenting on the fact that Japanese men were short-sighted and diminutive physically, i.e., you know, just being racist and deciding, well, these guys can't be good fighter pilots. Well, it turns out they could be very, very good fighter pilots, and Singapore fell very quickly, as did basically all British territory in Southeast Asia. This also fits with a wider um, lack of preparedness by the British for World War II, but in Asia, the British fold like cards in the face of Japanese uh, military power and aggression. So do the Americans. The Philippines, which is an American colony, falls to Japanese advance, and General Douglas MacArthur, whom we'll be hearing a lot about in the next couple of classes, you know, he's, uh, he's military commander in the Philippines and he famously says, I shall return. Real, real flair for the dramatic, Douglas MacArthur. Um, he says, I shall return, and then he goes to Australia. Uh, and and, and as, as he's on his way, the Japanese are successfully taking Thailand, Burma, the Philippines, they already have Vietnam. Um, and they really, they really are now, this co-prosperity sphere, this empire of Japan, whatever the heck you want to call it, is really very formidable indeed. It's important to point out, and it's worth pointing out, and it's the kind of thing maybe we would have had more of a discussion of in person, um, in class, that the behavior of Japanese troops and the Japanese military more broadly um, is sadly often repugnant, um, if not evil in some cases. We've mentioned the rape of Nanjing in class before, where at least 15,000 non-combatants were killed in the Chinese city of Nanjing over the winter of 37 to 38. Um, some people claim up to 200, 300,000 people, which is, which is unlikely. But as I mentioned before, um, it doesn't matter what spin you put on it, Nanjing was a horrific uh, war crime. Uh, you had a famine in Vietnam that took out hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese, largely through just Japanese neglect um, and a lack of interest by the Japanese regime in helping local Vietnamese uh, get past this, this natural disaster. Um, and then the, the uh, utterly depressing um, concept of the comfort women, which is women taken... Uh, from various areas controlled by the Japanese and placed in facilities uh, where they would offer um, sexual services to Japanese military officers. Effectively, a systematic, formally supported and constructed system of rape. Um, and this is, as I'm sure you can understand, an incredibly touchy subject going right up until today, um, where there are still surviving comfort women who, you know, there have been Moves towards apologies of various types by the Japanese state, um, not really anything that's ever kind of satisfied um, the people, the, the victims, the victims of this system. Um, and it's an extreme, well, what's really chilling with the comfort women concept um, beyond the, the, the obvious horror of what happened to the victims is how bureaucratic it was and how kind of well laid out it was. And a lot of effort went into establishing these centers and, you know, recruiting, that's a euphemism, and women to bring them into the system. Um, Korea, of course, which had been a colony of Japan since 1910, produced more comfort women than any other country in, in any other country. And um, many of those women were turned in by uh, relatives of theirs, or at least fellow Korean, Korean men. And so this, this has created massive, massive problems uh, to this day, uh, in particularly, of course, in Korean-Japanese relations, but in Japanese relations with, with really all the other countries of East and Southeast Asia.
Domestically in Japan too, there's very interesting questions. So why do I keep talking about is Japan fascist? And this is going to be important. I mean, the central kind of hub of that kind of conversation, you know, is around the idea if one sees Japan as a fascist state at this particular time, one could also create the narrative idea that it was effectively a small number of Japanese. And so therefore, things like the comfort women crimes and the rape of Nanjing crimes, all these other things um, can be laid at the feet of this minority who were also, um, you know, uh, who were also imposing their will and were also mistreating fellow Japanese. So in, in things like government censorship and everything else, but also in this really fascinating, aggressive, uber militaristic, you know, you know, uber masculinized concept of loyalty to the state, particularly in the military. So for example, a famous example would be um, the kamikaze pilots, right? Um, the idea of these pilots who are flying their ships into, uh, sorry, flying their planes into American ships to try and take them down. Kamikaze is a very interesting Japanese word. It actually goes back to the 12th century when the Mongols were trying to invade um, Japan. This is at the time of Genghis Khan. Uh, and the Mongols are trying to invade and they fail. One of the main invasion attempts by the Mongols fails because of this uh, storm that runs down the Sea of Japan, which becomes kind of identified by Japanese intellectuals as uh, the kamikaze, the divine wind, kamikaze. And now we're seeing it being used again in this kind of interesting context. There's lots of that kind of weird, you know, manipulation of supposedly eternal Japanese concepts of samurai identity and all this kind of stuff. But of course, it all serves this idea um, of this, you know, fighting spirit kind of idea and, and uh, of loyalty to the emperor and loyalty to the state and the gyokusei, uh, which our readings talk about, this idea of fighting to the last man. So that so that you end up seeing after the war turns, and the war turns in the summer of 42, the Battle of Midway is a major, major turning point after which, in truth, the Japanese are effectively in retreat the entire time. Um, the fighting is horrifically vicious in places like Saipan and New Guinea, and even going back up uh, towards Iwo Jima um, and towards the Japanese mainland. Um, the Americans undertake this strategy of island hopping. Uh, MacArthur gets to come and say, I have returned to the Filipino people. Um, and the Americans, kind of, I should say the Allies, but really it's the Americans, are island hopping. They're jumping from um, island to island up the Pacific up towards the Japanese mainland. And the Japanese, as we're seeing in our sources, are fighting them all the way. As we're getting towards the end of World War II, the question is, how is this all going to end? In 1944, in Casablanca, the Allies make it clear they expect, quote unquote, unconditional surrender from all the Axis powers. There is this um, declaration of Potsdam, we'll talk about more in a future class, that effectively kind of crafts this idea of like a, a fascist Japan narrative. But the combination of the lack of interest among the Allies in taking any kind of a traditional kind of negotiated peace and the increasingly aggressive um, ideological language back in Japan or in, in the Jap in Japanese territory driving on Japanese troops creates a real question of how the war is going to end. Um, you probably know that on the 6th of August 1945 the Americans dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima and on the 9th of August 1945 dropped a nuclear bomb on Nagasaki um, killing between 40 and 75,000 people instantly in Nagasaki and killing about 130,000 people in Hiroshima. And the thing about the nuclear bomb, of course, beyond the, the uh, terrifying capacity to immediately remove life in that way, was that it was a new weapon and a new weapon that nobody else had and a very scary weapon. And that brings the war to an end virtually immediately, as we'll talk about next week. So that was kind of the Japanese experience in, in, in the war, is this kind of this rise and rise and rise in the summer of 1942, and then a very dramatic and very painful and prolonged defeat. The war doesn't end until the summer of 45, but as of the autumn to winter of 42, you know, looking back at least with hindsight, it's very hard to see any kind of path to victory for the Japanese. So the discussion question for the video, and really kind of going off the readings as well, you'll definitely have had to have read the readings to kind of get a sense of this, is... Is this kind of ideological response among the Japanese after the summer 1942, the, the increased kind of indoctrination style uh, insistence, propaganda insistence of fighting to the last man and everything else, is that a product um, of a, a refusal to accept the reality defeat might actually be coming? Or is it a logical kind of next step and a logical evolution of the kind of propaganda and kind of fascistic tendencies we've been seeing in Japanese politics since 1932 and in some sections since before that. Thanks for watching.